The Tim Hill Podcasts. Ordinary people's extraordinary stories. Welcome to the Tim Hill Podcasts. In this episode, I'm going to have a chance, a chat with Vance. Vance is going to tell us where and when he was born. He's also going to describe what it was like where he grew up. He's going to tell us about the schools he went to and the education he received. So Vance, over to you, mate. Hey, it's great to be here, Tim. Um, I've been looking forward to this and I've been listening to your podcast and I, I am loving season one of what you put together there. It's, it's, it's an audio book. It's your biography, but uh, I, I couldn't put it down. I started listening and I've just kept going and going. I'm on number six now and listening in. So congrats on that. It's a wonderful piece of work. Thank you very much. Let, yeah. Let me know if you get to, to episode 24. Well, I will. I'm sure I will because I'm I'm in now. You've got me hooked, and I've got to, I know got to know what happens next. And uh, yeah, it's great. And and I really love your philosophy of saying, you know, ordinary people can have extraordinary lives, and it shouldn't just be limited to the stories and the stars and the the channels and the big things yeah. like Netflix. It should be a lot of people who record what they do and uh, leave that behind for kids and grandkids and other people to learn from and understand what your life was really like. So uh, my kudos on that. That's that's fantastic stuff. That's what I set out to do is is to leave a legacy. Yes. And if, and I, yeah. and if, if everybody can leave that legacy for their generations to come, then I've achieved my aim. So yeah. my, my aim now is to, to, to do as many people as possible to lead their legacy for the future. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. Very- yeah, on to, oh, you want to talk about me, don't you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's do that. Um, so, out there. Let's yeah, your story is out there. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's get this one down. Okay, so you got to start with me in Saskatchewan, which is uh, one of the provinces in Canada, tiny town called Fenwood, which had about 91 people in it. And I spent five years there just as a kid. In fact, that's going to be the setting then, became the setting for my fantasy story of novels that came later on. So not much remembrance there of, of growing up, but a, a good place to start out. Moved to a place called Creston, BC, which was on the side of a mountain. And we managed to snag the top hit house on a place they called Snob Hill, which was Ooh. supposed to be where all the rich people lived. So I don't know how we ended up there because <laughs> where, where we came from in Fenwood, Saskatchewan was anything but opulent or rich. It was... It was as low kind of on the totem as you could go. Uh, very rough and tumble. So to get on the top of Snob Hill, but the incredible thing about being up there was that you had the whole Creston Valley, mountains all around you. And in my backyard, literally in my backyard, step away from my sandbox was a mountain. And it was a wild place. There was there was bears up there. There was animals and critters. And I could actually go up there and build forts. Uh, the place right beside me was the reservoir for the town. It was stocked with rainbow trout. There was canyons and places to ride our bikes. And it was the kind of magical quintessential place to grow up as a child. I, I can't imagine anything better. So living there was was a dream. It was a wonderful place to be. Uh, and I was what enjoying it. What's that? What was, it like, what was it like during the winter then? Did you, obviously, you've got a mountain there. Yeah. Kind of the, Gets a little bit of snow during the winter. Oh man, they did set you, records. Did you get a chance to ski. Did oh you yeah, ski to school. Yeah, it, it, it's. Uh, we were at the top of the hill, so you would almost ski in your car. It was crazy to get down that hill and riding your bikes and the rest of it. Uh, that was the snow there was legendary. Um, up at the pass, which led out of town, you would often get snowed in and you couldn't get out. Uh, the cars would be between solid walls of snow. It's like that stuff you see in Iceland and really far northern places. Really yeah. snowy place. Um, but great place. I just uh, I did a podcast about my brother building me a bobsled track and sending me down it and almost killing me on his <laughs> bobsled run. I did those in one of my podcasts recently. It was It was a magical place. It really was. Eight cherry trees in the yard and summer and blossoms and and apples and orchards and things around. Uh, I couldn't imagine, you know, just how much better it could be. I, and I think maybe one of the most fascinating parts is it was that my parents were extremely busy, both of them. So they never really kept track of us. So I'm a, I am moved there about five or six years of age. They had no idea during the day where I was. 
And I was free to roam with my brother and he'd take me on my bike. And I'm a little six-year-old kid on my bike going through these canyons to go fishing for kokanee salmon. And, and I would walk across, there's a, a trestle bridge, you can look it up. It's still there over the canyon. As a six-year-old, I walked across that trestle bridge. There's no guardrails. You know, we'd listen, we'd listen and put an ear down to the track to say if a train was coming, but did that really work? I don't know. I lived, you know, I never <laughs> fell off it, but it was just so crazy to be in this situation where you were just left to your own to explore and to find out and survive and, and make do. And, and, uh, it was great. And then my father decided that uh, we needed to move and lock, stock and barrel. We moved off of Snob Hill and we moved to Prince George, British Columbia, named after the Prince George back there in 1942. I think he passed away. Uh, but Prince George, British Columbia, which is northern and as rough as you can get. It's a northern town, logging, mining, pulp mills. It's industrial. You know, I think you could probably think of some places there in the UK that yeah. would probably connect in that same way. So a bit rougher, and I'm kind of this kid that I, I don't know how to connect here. I, I don't know how to how to fit into this. Uh, a bit shy. Um, I've, I never was... Uh, the friendly out. I like the outdoors. I like to just be by myself and be out there in the bush and, and wandering around. So I couldn't connect very well. And uh, then I, it was really interesting because my grade four teacher, and I didn't like going to school. In fact, I hated it. I, I could, I didn't like to go at all. I, I wasn't. It wasn't that I was doing bad in it. I could ace everything. In fact, they wanted to advance me grades just to get me out of their classroom. I guess, but. Uh, <laughs> Great, great for teacher. She all of a sudden one day opens The Hobbit and she starts to read us The Hobbit. I hadn't been reading much up till then. I just wasn't into it. I was into Tell building. Me, right? Yeah. Yeah. She, she reads The Hobbit and my mind just went, what is this? That's in a book? I didn't know that was in books. I thought books were dry and dusty stuff. You know, all we had at home was a rack of Encyclopedia Britannicas. I'd have read all of those <laughs> too, but eventually... But, but I just, I couldn't believe it. And that's what started me on this journey of reading everything, uh, fantasy and then science fiction. My brother was into Dune, Frank Herbert and Dune and, and all the rest of that. And I started to love books and, uh, that I think changed my kind of view of school. Um, I loved books. And then the other thing that I loved, and I recently did a podcast on that one, I think last, just last week was the shop classes. Oh, man, this is Northern British Columbia. It's an industrial world. So all the school people got together and said, our children shall learn industry. Our children shall learn industrial arts is what they called it. So every school above the elementary level had a shop built onto it. And it was a big building. And it was equipped with the best gear, the best wood, the best everything. And when I walked into that building from my elementary school into my junior high, I, I was sure the angels were singing above me and just kind of going, ah, look at this. And I couldn't believe it. I, I was I was just like, this is really cool. So I had my books, which I actually got kicked out of English class for reading a novel, if you can believe <laughs> that. The, the teacher was instructing and it was as boring as watching paint dry. And, and so I had my, one of my science fantasy novels and I, I stuck it under my desk. I started reading and I got so engrossed. I didn't realize she was coming up to me and that the room had grown quiet and I got sent out into the hall and then down to the principal's office for doing something unheard of reading in English class. <laughs> oh, how terrible. Outrageous. <laughs> reading a book in, in an English class. Well, you uh, love it. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I said, I, my, my schooling life, you know, those, those shop classes, but by the time I got to senior high, the shop was even bigger. It was massive. It had two woodwork shops. It was so big. And then we had drafting and I learned how to do drafting. And that's where I got into building design and some of that stuff. And we did technology and we'd break things with these huge breaking presses and uh, we'd smash things, and then we had electronics, and I made light organs for my bedroom. Uh, we made our own furniture. I won a furniture competition. We learned how to build log homes. And so, you know, this is, I graduated in 1979. So in 1979, uh, I was handed a chainsaw 
and given permission to walk along these log walls and cut notches out and roll logs around and make a log house with my mates in school. And oh. it would have been good, except that it was, I think, a two-hour class. And at the halfway mark, some of those boys were going out and smoking a bit of that wacky tobacco, you know, <laughs> what we call in those days. And uh, they were coming back a little bit less steady on the walls than I would have liked to get close to. <laughs> so I watched out for those guys because a, a chainsaw in their hands wasn't a good idea at that point in time. Yeah. So, but it, it's just so interesting to, and I hadn't really, I had taken it so much for granted, I think, until I started telling some people about what we did in our industrial arts classes. And they started going, that's unbelievable. I never had an opportunity to do anything like that, you know? You couldn't do it nowadays, I bet. No, I mean, no. the old uh, health and safety oh. herbs are in there and, and stopping life as it as we know it. Yeah, <laughs> you, you could not have. And, and it's funny, I've been listening, of course, to your podcast and your, your experience in the military. My grade nine shop teacher was from the military and he ran that shop with precision. You did mm. not step out of line. We had inspection. We had to put our backs against the wall. The bell would ring. He'd come out the door. He'd walk down the line inspecting everybody. You had a ring on, it's coming off. You got a necklace on, it's coming off. Long sleeve shirt, sleeves, they're being rolled up. Because we had full-on industrial machines that could rip your arm off. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just it, it's been, it was such a, a interesting time frame to just be learning and absorbing, you know, the art I still have a, I have a scar in one of my hands here where I stuck a chisel in when I was, <laughs> it was art class and we were allowed to carve plaster of Paris and I was supposed to make a hand. So I was carving on the plaster of Paris hand with this very sharp chisel and I stuck it into my own hand. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so thankfully I ended up, I still got all 10 fingers so I can type properly. But um, yeah, what a, what an interesting world in that uh, Northern industrial town. And from there, of course, I just went on and I then got into planting trees uh, once I graduated and that was a seasonal job and I planted just over half a million in eight seasons and uh, learned a lot, learned a lot about was, life. Was that in Canada? That was in Canada, right around Prince George. So Prince George is a logging town and I almost so went in. To taking them down and they're, they're yeah. replanting to, to keep the business going. Yeah, well, the vistas always look substantially changed if you look into clear-cut logging, which is what they were doing. Um, but um, the logging company was required by law that when they took these down, they had to re-put them back. And then we would go in and it was the kind of experience I, I didn't expect. I didn't know what to expect when I got there. And I have to admit, as a young man, I cried. I, I'd, I'd never been in anything that tough in my life. And the psychological pressure, because uh, you would plant your trees, but a, a government official would check them. And if they weren't perfect and the roots were showing, or if there was too much moss around, uh, if there wasn't the right number in a circle that he'd throw randomly, you would lose percentage. And under 80%, you wouldn't get paid. And your percentage went against the whole crew and they wouldn't get paid. So the pressure of being... Yes, with this group, then you were kind of comrades in arms mm. out to conquer this block and get out of there. Our longest one was 21 days in one place without a shower, without fresh food, and on a burn, which meant everything was black, hot black dust for 21 days. And uh, my friend that I was planting with had a grand mall seizure at the end of that 21 days because we just went too hard. So mm. it wasn't military in the sense, but I, I think I experienced something that would be you know, akin to that, having the comrades with you, but yet this, this thing that you have to conquer and get through to get to the other side. It was, it was quite a, I would say a, a change in my life at that point in time. Mm -hmm. I had been a, bit of a wimpy kid, a bookworm. And I still, to this day, don't know why when the guy said, Hey, you want to come join my tree planting crew? And I said, sure, <laughs> let's, let's, let's try that. That sounds, I can, I can plant a tree. Yeah, but can you plant 2,700 in one day, which was the highest I ever got to? Yeah. Well, yep. So, so, so that lasted, what, eight seasons? So what, what did you do in the off-season? Oh, in the off-season, I was uh, working. I did some schooling. I uh, did some other odd jobs and things that I was working on, moving about. And, of course, in the midst of that, uh, got married fairly young. I think I was 20, 21. And uh, we have three children. And uh, we uh, 
where we live now in Three Hills. I actually designed and built my own home. It's built out of uh, styrofoam blocks with concrete center, six inches. So the walls are a, a foot thick. I have a, mm -hmm. I have my own castle. I didn't have to come right. to the UK. I made my own <laughs> castle. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great place. Uh, and then my in-laws joined me. So I, I made it a piece on the house that they could live in. And my kids got married and I made a piece in the house that they could live in. So we had four generations living in the one mm -hmm. house for a while. And right now, during the way the world is, I've got one daughter at home. I've got a son and his son in the basement. Uh, my mother-in-law has passed away a year ago, but my father-in-law still lives in his place. And I, I find this whole thing, you know, people say, don't you go crazy? And I go, I, I think this is life. I think chaos and mixture and things flying around and, and things going, that's, that's kind of a sign of, uh, of life and, and joy mm. for me. You know, uh, they say rest in peace. And I figure that's the time I'll get to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I have this, um, this theory on life. You, you've got the one life you've got to live it and live every day as though it's your last. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I always think always keep your glass half full. Yes. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, what you were talking in your podcast, you know, with your experiences and I was, I was laughing at the one where Alan switches places with you on patrol and he gets shot in the arse yeah. <laughs> and, yes. and I, and you just never know. Up, you. What's that? <laughs> you couldn't make it up. No, you couldn't make it up. And it, it's such it's a great a story. Way. Yeah. Mm. But, and yeah. I think you, you go through things like that and you just realize I better live every day. Like it's my last cause Theoretically, one it is. Will be. <laughs> one day it will be. Yeah, exactly. It's coming down the pipe. It's going to come one of these days. So, yeah, I totally agree with that uh, philosophy. Uh, mm -hmm. I've done a, a fair bit of work with um, an ancient wisdom book. It was written about 2,500 years ago. And I loved it so much. I started studying it when I was younger. And it just kind of ebbed away with me for years. And then finally, I thought, you know, this book's not getting a fair shake out there in the world. Uh, something's wrong. The, the translation just seems wonky. And so I went in and I retranslated it. And by the time I was done, I had it all memorized. It's about 5,000 words. And then I went on, because I have theater friends, I love the theater, and I love to sing and oh, act yeah. in musicals, right? So I asked my theater friends, hey, what should I do with this? I've got it memorized. And they said, oh, turn it into a show, a one-man show. And I said, well, how am I going to keep people entertained? Oh, you love cooking? Do some cooking. So my friends built me a brazier, live fire, and I would roast uh, eggplant and garlic and tomatoes. And then I had eggs in a pan and I would make this uh, Iranian dish called Mirza Hesame. And uh, on stage while reciting 5,000 words in costume, and then I would share it with the audience. <laughs> but the reason Crazy. I bring that <laughs> the reason I bring it up is because it goes exactly with with what you just said, because one of the most famous lines in that book is, whatever your hand finds to do, do it all with all your might. Because in the grave where you're eventually going, there's not going to be yeah. time to work and plan and do these other things. Do it now, is what the guy said, right? So I, I follow that line of thought and say, you know, if there's a chance, take it. Yeah. Absolutely. You bet. So you've done eight seasons yep. planting trees and you did some other bits and pieces. So that, so I guess that's what, eight years? Yeah, eight, eight years, years ago. From leave, leaving school. You did, yeah. did, you, did you go after high school? Did you go to, to college, university or? Yeah, that's a very interesting story you there. Tim. With the university of life at our <laughs> Knox. No, it's, it's a very interesting story. So in the reason my father was so busy is because he was a pastor and he was a church planting pastor, which means they'd send him in to an area and then he would start new churches in and around that area. So he's responsible for three churches that are in Prince George, but it's hard work to get all of that off the ground. Mm -hmm. And with all that hard work, uh, and I'm just going merrily through life, doing my thing and enjoying bike riding through the bush and doing my stuff. Uh, I'm, 18, I'm coming up into grade 12, it's January, and my father drops dead of a heart attack at age 52, just gone. Mm -hmm. No thought or advance warning or anything of what's going on. So at that point in time, I'm just, I'm 
you know, you're shell shocked. You don't know what's going on. I'm coming up to graduation. I'm supposed to be deciding what I'm going to do. What am I going to do? And so I thought I'll stick in the family business. And I said, okay, I'm going to become a pastor because we just lost one and I'm going to do what he did. And so I went off to the school and to the seminary and, uh, Lo and behold, you know, I've got a master's degree now in, uh, in uh, biblical studies. And I've never actually went that route. I never actually <laughs> got there. But at the time, it was kind of like I just felt this onus to, to go after there and do that. And uh, so, and I had a great time. You know, I'd, uh, we had our family started there and being in those schools and in those communities was, was really enjoyable in a lot of ways. But uh, right now, I um, I got out of the schooling side of things, and I'm in this little town called Three Hills, and my son all of a sudden says to me, Dad, I want to go act in the play of Oliver. Oliver, you know, Oliver. I want to be, I, I never before, yeah, no. I wanted more. you know, so he says, I want to go and be in that play. I want to be Noah. And I said, okay. And see, when I grew up in a very conservative family, we weren't to be in theater. So I never got to go into that. And mm. so I said to him, sure, I'll take you over. I, I want you to have what I didn't get to do. And I always wanted to do that. And uh, I was standing at the back of the audition hall. And he goes up there, does his audition. And the two directors chat. And one of them turns around to me and she says, do you sing? And I said, well, yeah, I really like singing. I've been in the choir. Da, da, da. She said, can you hit this note? And she hits this high C. One boy, boy for sale. You know, it's it's Bumble's song. And I said, oh, yeah, I can hit that. And she goes, okay, you're Bumble. And I said, <laughs> I said, just like that? I said, I didn't come here to audition. She said, no, nobody else can hit that note. You're Bumble. And my son looked at me and he's nodding and he's saying, and I look at him and I go, well, this could be cool. I'm going to go and play with my son. We're going to do this together. And so I hit the boards and did Bumble and I loved it. I just loved it. And then so I went on from that and I was Anna Green Gables with my daughter. Uh, recently, I was Daddy Warbucks with my granddaughter. Uh, we went together and we did that one together. That was an amazing amount of fun. And uh, I just fell in love with it. So then when this job opened up that I have now, I've had it 13 years and it's Canada's largest outdoor theater stage. It's in a place oh. called Drumheller, Drumheller, Alberta, which is the dinosaur capital of the world. It's got one of the largest dinosaur museums ever anywhere. About a half a million people come every year to look at it from around the world. And we built this amphitheater. It's an outdoor amphitheater. It's gorgeous. Uh, it's right in these badlands, just really stark, stark, beautiful area. And so I run this amphitheater. And one of the things we do is a passion play, which is a more of a European tradition than it is a mm -hmm. Canadian tradition. But ours has been going about 30 years. So that's one of the things we do. And then we do concerts and light shows and fireworks. And and I'm just building. Uh, I've been designing and building a new um, theater. Uh, it's a little yeah. black box, little black box theater, and we're building that and uh, going to have great fun. So these uh, uh, that thing when I said about the ancient wisdom of whatever your hand finds to do, yeah. do it with all your might. Why do people get so enraptured with the career? You know, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do. This. They map their life out from a you know a young person in this direction, and I look at that and I, I maybe it works for them. I don't know. It must work for some people. For me, I, I bounce more. I'm like Tigger, you know, mm. Winnie the Pooh. I'm like Tigger <laughs> with his mount. <laughs> oh, brilliant. So uh, let's just rein you back a little bit because I okay. think we've gone a little bit too far ahead now. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I told you I'm Tigger. <laughs> yeah. So... You've gone. You've gone through your your school. You, you've you've had your first job planting trees, and you've also gone to vicar school to be a vicar. Um, after your dad passed away. Yeah. Did you actually sort of qualify as, as a pastor as a vicar? Oh yeah. If I if I would have applied, and it's really interesting. <laughs> Again, it, the interesting segues in life just sometimes boggle my mind. It's like you're, you're telling me about your, 
story that you want to write about your brother who passed mm -hmm. away at such a, a, a young age about what his life could have been like. And sometimes I look back and I go, wow. Uh, do you guys watch Bugs Bunny over there? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Bugs, Bugs Bunny... Uh, he, it's the, the tunnel is coming through the, uh, through the desert. You can see this mound of dirt and all of a sudden his yeah. head pops up. He looks at the map and he says, I knew I should have taken that, that left turn at Albuquerque. And, and you look at it and you go, my life could have gone there. And there was a yeah. point in time where a church on the coast of British Columbia down near Vancouver, uh, was interested in me coming to them. But at the same time, uh, at the school where I'd been, a friend of mine wanted me to come and help her in the library. And I chose the library. Mm. And I became a public services librarian. I started looking at getting my master's in library science because I love books so much. You know, mm. it, it, it was funny that when the, when the rubber met the road and it was the time for the choice of follow in your father's footsteps and become the vicar, the pastor, or follow your love of books and literature, I actually took the books. And mm -hmm. it it was an interesting, you know, I look at it back at it now and I can kind of more see my motivation. But at the time, it was like people were looking at me and saying, what, you just did eight years of school or five years, whatever it was. I think it was four, <laughs> four and three. I think it was seven. You, you just did that. And now you're going to go into, you're going to be a librarian? And... <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it just, just it kind of didn't make a whole lot of sense to them. To me, I thought I'm I'm going to try this, and I loved it. I you know setting up the library, ordering the books, researching the books. Um, I would be there alone for the most part of the summer when most of the students were gone, and I would rearrange and redesign the whole flow of the library and the way the books were were arranged in the different sections. Um, just I love that side of things. So, it, it, you know, you look back now and you go, okay, I think I see why I did that. But at the time, mm. it's like, okay, I want to go there. And you do it. So this, this, this library was in a, in a university, in a college? Yes, was it? yeah, I did a college and seminary. Yeah. 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 So, so. What, what, what college was it? Was, was it general studies or was it Pacific? No, it was specific. It was a specific seminary training, uh, biblical training and leadership training, and all the rest of that would go that would go towards your being, you know, in the in the church in some capacity or another. Right. So, gotcha. yeah. So I took the left turn at Albuquerque, and uh, things just never never stopped from there. I just kept bouncing and doing doing things that I found interesting. Uh, if your job is boring, I know sometimes we have to do boring jobs because we have to, you know, pay the bills. We have to look yeah. after the family and the people that are relying on us. That's all. And and I never poo poo that because that's that's important stuff. Yeah. But yet at the same yeah. time, if you can find something, uh, the one thing I think my father said that stuck with me is that if you don't love your job, it won't matter how much they pay you. Yeah. And it just absolutely, you know, so. Well, yeah. well, the day I die, if I can die and say that I've lived a life on one of my own choosing, then I should be fairly happy. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's important to be able to to live a life that you want to live um, yeah. to the best of your ability. Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, and, and and it's it, it's so easy to, to just to fall into a rut uh, and, and do the same thing day in, day out and... and and go home at the end of the day and bitch about I, I hate my job or wish I could do something else. Yeah. The following morning you get up and you go and do the same thing again. Yes. Yeah. Without like giving yourself the opportunity to say, right. Wow. Yeah. What I, yeah, what what I, yeah. 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 They, they say a rut is simply a coffin with the ends kicked out. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's just, you're, you're kind of just dying. You're, you're dying in the middle of your life. And, and I would, I would admit, and I think we have to admit that, that uh, these years, uh, the years that I've had and the years that I've lived have been years of opportunity. There's been plenty of people in different cultures and different times where they just did not have the latitude to decide that we have now, you know, yeah. at least, at least some of us, I, I think there are many places still in the world where your choices are, are quite limited. Um, but it's like what you just said, even though in your choices are limited, can you choose to be happy in them? You know, can you embrace 
what you have to find the joy in it. Uh, I think that's always a trick for sure. Mm -hmm. So how long was you uh, at the, the library for? Uh, the library, the library only, uh, yeah, that didn't last a whole long time because uh, as I discovered being in the library, I loved the books. Uh, I loved the uh, concept. I didn't like the job. And mm. so when their head librarian, who was my boss, uh, he said, I'm retiring. And I've talked to the board of directors. I've talked to the school. And they want to make you the head librarian. And we want to send you for training out east as to get your master of library science. And we want you to sign a contract to be here to be our librarian for whatever it was. I think it was a five-year contract or something, you know, based on the fact of them paying for the schooling. Mm. And I went home. We talked with my wife. And I just kind of looked at her. And I said, I don't think I can do that. I, I don't want his job per se. I don't want to be the top person with all of that to do. I kind of liked what I was doing. My, my office was, you know, <laughs> my office was in the center of the library in kind of a fishbowl. And the reason for that is there was also a high school with the college on the same campus. And I was to keep eyes on all those little high school critters so they wouldn't act up <laughs> and, and they wouldn't disturb the study patterns of all the college students. So I had this fishbowl that I sat in. So no windows in it. It was just me in there and mm. I could look all around. It was kind of a little bit weird. It was almost like a, you were a jailer uh, in the bubble kind of speak. But so I took that office and I grew plants in it. I put grow bulbs in. So there was vines growing up all the walls. <laughs> and then I, then I hung kites from the ceiling. So there was kites up there in color. And I realized after the while, I thought, you know what? I'm liking this, but it's not where I want to stay. So I mm. thanked them very much. And I said, uh, tree planting season's coming up. I'll pack up all my gear and I'll head out back to northern BC and go plant trees for three months and see what comes up. Mm. And uh, on the way back home, we stopped in at Three Hills to this place just to visit and say hello. And we kind of said, well, let's try that. And the try has turned into, I think, 30 years now I've been here. I think 20 in this house alone. So I never in the life of me ever imagined. I, I'm a northern BC and a Creston BC guy with mm. mountains in his backyard and forests and trees. And here I am out in the bald prairies. I mean, I can see. I am looking right now. I'm looking 10 miles away. That's how far I can see right now. I can see a light on the hill. It's 10 miles away. I know it's 10 miles away. Mm. Without a, without a lump in sight, <laughs> nothing. There's there's a there's a seed cleaning there's a seed cleaning plant where we clean the seeds to plant the next year. It's between me and the lumps, but uh, so in my backyard, which is just down there, I have recreated the forest. I have spruce trees. I have three ponds, two rivers that join with pumps. I have waterfalls. I have a timber frame. Uh, gazebo that I built a couple of years ago with a wood burning fireplace in it's my winter cabin and I can go right in there and and close it in with plastic and uh and I'm on the edge of town so I've got nobody around that I can really see just see out there mm. so I've managed to kind of bring the northern BC into my yard to compensate for the fact but I never in my life imagined that I would be it, I thought it was a short-term stop but then my wife's parents came to visit and ended up staying and living. And then my kids grew up and they got married to people in this town. And now I have three <laughs> grandchildren that live three blocks that way. I am here, you know, this is where, this is where I'm going to be. I'm sure. So what was it that kept you there then? Well, it was, what, just, oh, yeah. What, what, what magnet stopped you escaping? What, what was the job that, that you, you, you've been tree planting for three months and you've, you've stopped off? <laughs> yeah, stopped off. And it was, and again, it was kind of this interesting segue. I stopped off and there's this high school in town and they were needing someone to be their registrar to work with the kids and to do a little bit of teaching and so forth. And I looked at it and I went, oh, this could be kind of fun. And my kids, it was private school. My kids can go to the school. I'm going to do this. And uh, just launched myself into it. And 
and they thought I was nuts. Like I, I ch changed everything when I could get my hands on and started doing all kinds of new things that they'd never seen before. And they'd kind of go, you know, very conservative town. Who is this guy? Where did he come from? Should we send them back? Um, so yeah, and, and that was fun. And then, like I said, where I now work, when this kind of petered out and it was over and I looked around, and I thought, there's nothing really else in town I want to do. Uh, I, nothing. I did a bit of a stint of construction, building hotels for a bit, but uh, I didn't really know what I was going to do. And I thought, well, sh are we going to have to move? Don't really want to move. Got all the family here. Uh, and then I was in the hotel and I was doing uh, 61 tile setting. I was being a tile setter. So I was putting all the ceramic tiles on all the walls and we had to put them on with glue and it stunk bad. So I had a respirator mask and I can still remember my phone rang. And so I, I stuffed it up under the mask. And this voice on the other end said, Vance, there's this amphitheater down in Drumheller. Uh, you should go take a look. And I went, yeah, I don't think so. That doesn't sound like up my alley. But being the person I am, I thought you never, ever turn something away without taking a look. Turn the stone over. What's under the stone? You know, might be a weed, might be a frog, or it might be a gold coin. Who knows? So I turned the stone over. I went and met the people and I went, this is a cool place. Uh, I love theater. I love music. I love musicals. Uh, I want to be part of this. And it's 45 minutes. It's exactly 61 kilometers from my front door to my office space. And it's the world's easiest commute other than when it's a blizzard, then it's not good. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's an easy commute. And that's how I, I like, I memorized that book of 5,000 words. It's because I had you know, I would just put it on in my headphones and listen mm -hmm. as I went down back and forth each day by myself. Uh, I drive a 1997 Honda Civic Si, which is a wonderful little car. I've had three of them already. And um, I that's what I commute in. They're beautiful in the snow, great little cars. And I actually only have to go, when I go to work, I have to stop once and downshift twice. Other than that, it's between me. It's open road. It's the prairies. It's just hit, yeah. hit the cruise control. Yeah, hit the cruise. and the thing about 1997 Honda Civics, the cruise control always works even 20 years later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great cars. Yeah. So the amphitheater then. Yes. What was the first thing that you put on there? Well, when I arrived, this amphitheater had been specifically designed for the Passion Play. It's the Canadian Badlands Passion Play. And that's really all they wanted to do was they wanted to put on the life of Christ every year. And it was run with 200 volunteers. It was a big production, mm. uh, but there really wasn't anything else going on in the amphitheater at that time. And so I kind of looked around and I said to the board of the directors, Hey, this is great. This is our flagship. We do this really well. And it's one of the best in the world, but we can't just, you know, this is a town of 9,000. It's a tourist town. We can't just let this amphitheater sit empty the other nine months of the year. Uh, we should be bringing in um, different shows, different people, different things. And they said, sure, try to find what else we can put on. So I just started adding things in. And uh, now, you know, we just landed a group. I, they're probably known over there. Do you know the Canadian group, the Bare Naked Ladies? Have you ever heard of that? No. <laughs> probably not. It's a Canadian, <laughs> Canadian rock pop. Yeah, it's quite a funny name, isn't it? Uh, you know. We just, they're coming now, August 19th. They sing that song, if I had a million dollars, if I had a million dollars, um, and a whole bunch of others. They're a Canadian icon. They are big here, uh, you know. So we're bringing them in, and uh, we're bringing in Global Fest fireworks, and we're launching a new culinary program where we're going to do wood-fired barbecue. I love cooking. So I've got mm. barbecues coming from Texas and being custom built in Lumsden, Saskatchewan. And we're going to do all this crazy, great, fun stuff. I, I think uh, if I could maybe explain it this way, when I got to the Passion Play uh, organization and they kind of asked questions of who I was, I had to really think through what are the things that drive me? And I came up with the fact that all my life I've had three core values and my core values are creativity community and celebration. Mm -hmm. And if I can bring those three together for other people and see them smile, like when I'm on stage to see people smile and enjoy or laugh or cry, I'm in my element. So if I can create something great 
that mm. brings something out to people that helps them to celebrate the fact that they're alive and they are embracing good things. I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. So I'm having a great time there. Brilliant. So this is kind of brings us up to almost up to date then. So Harry Potter. Yes. Yes. Harry Potter. Oh, Harry Potter was mentioned in your, um, your bio. Yes. Now I'm, I am a big Harry Potter fan. Yes. I yeah. love Harry Potter. Yeah. I've read all the books several times over. Yeah. I've got the audio books and I've got the films. Yeah. Um, I'm following the, the old, the fantastic beasts. Yeah. Can't wait for the 8th of April when, uh, um, the old, uh, Secrets of Dumbledore comes out. Oh, so, yes. Yep. The two trailers that have been out now. So, yeah. yeah, quite excited for that. Yeah, no. And, and those kind of stories that will grab a culture and go cross generational and mm. become a touch point. I think what is so cool about those stories that they just like when you just said it now and I say, mm, yeah, it, it becomes a touch point for an entire generation and multiple generations, families, kids talking. I read um, yeah. I read them to my kids, of course, when they were starting small and then they took over as they grew up and started reading the subsequent ones themselves. Yeah. Uh, and and oh, I mean, if you want to see a house dedicated to memorabilia of Harry Potter. You'd have to go to my daughter's house with her uh, three children. We, we've had Harry Potter parties at our house where it's dress up time, right? So yeah, you, you can't, you can't, uh, you know, in that whole world. I love that kind of a story and that kind of a world. I love the fact that that story just engaged people with such messages uh, and sure the darkness of the world and the darkness of what's mm -hmm. around it. But such hope and camaraderie and working thing, things together and love and acceptance and, you know, um, staying true, all those good themes that were there. I love that stuff, you know, and I think that's where that's where I kind of got started. Uh, you know, I would never envisioned myself to be a writer, uh, but uh, I went in one time I was working at the high school and there was a, a tumor growing on the side of my face. And they said it had to come off or it was going to paralyze the side of my face. It wasn't cancerous, but I wasn't going to be able to move one side of my face. So they took me in and they did this facelift surgery and cut me all the way down to my neck. Eight hours later, they peeled my mm. face for six to eight hour surgery, microscopic, cutting it away from the nerves so I wouldn't be paralyzed. And uh, I woke up in the hospital uh, in this dark room. It's night and there's just the red glow and the hiss of these machines and there's someone groaning in a bed beside me in this recovery room. And I woke up with this idea for a fantasy story. And I got a hold of the nurse and I said, can, can you get me a pen and paper? I'd like to write something down. And she said, sure. And she came back with a line steno pad, nurse's steno pad and a red pen. I can still see it. I started to write down the story of Corvin. And it's in red ink and the lights are glowing and the things are hissing in my machine. And I wrote and wrote and wrote a number of pages, outline, put it down. And, uh, you know, then I got home and I kind of said to my son, hey, because we used to play these uh, fantasy role games, um, uh, Link, uh, Legend of Zelda, all of those yeah. together. And uh, I said to him, hey, I got this idea. And he goes, oh, that sounds like a cool story. I really like that. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll write some for you. So I started writing and I got in and I invented the kid's name. His name is Corvin. My middle name is Corwin and my first name is Vance. So I called him Corvan, C-O-R-V-A-N. And I wrote his, started writing his story. And my son was, and I'd read him to him. I'd always read my son's story as at night. I read him all of Dune and all of those. And um, I got partway in and then I got busy. He kind of moved on and it kind of fell away to the side like a lot of our projects do, especially when we're bouncing on to a new one. Yeah. And I put it away. I put it in a box and I put it over in the crawl space at the grandparents' house. And lo and behold, my daughter, four, five, six years go by. And my daughter, Elisa, who's living here now with us, uh, she comes up one day and she's got a white binder in her hand. She said, I was over in grandpa's crawl space and I found this book in a box. And I went, Oh, that's the hammer. I was writing that for your brother. And she said, well, I want to know what happens next. And I said, 
I don't know. I'd have to <laughs> read, it, read it again. And she said, well, will you write me a chapter for my birthday? And I said, I'd love to. So I wrote her a chapter for her birthday, gave it to her. She read it. She brought it back to me. She said, I like the chapter, but where's the girl? And I went, <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> okay, you're right. I was. I said I was writing this for your brother, so there was just this boy and his adventure. And she said, "Well, I want there to be a girl." So I invented a girl named Kate, and I went back into the story and I started and I wrote her into that first bit and I gave it back to her and said, Do "You like this?" She said, "Oh, I really like Kate. That's great. Can you finish it for Christmas?" And I went, "Oh Lord, how am I going to finish? This? <laughs> how am I going to finish this thing for Christmas? That's a hard road." But she's looking at me, you know, those the way your kids look at you with those eyes, kind of pleading. And I went, "Okay, I'll try." So I, I went to work. I went to town and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I finished the book. I gave it to a friend of mine who was an editor. And I said, I, I'm getting this to my daughter for Christmas. Would you just take a look at it and kind of, you know, catch any weird grammatical errors and stuff? She read it over, redlined it, and she gave it back to me. She said, you know what? The story is actually really good. She said, you should think about publishing it. And I went, really? She said, yeah, you really should. You should look at it. So I did. I sent out the letters to all the publishers out there. You know, and we all know the story of JK yeah. and, and and how these things can sometimes happen. But in my case, all I got back was rejection letters. And I started taping them on the back of my office door just to kind of keep, <laughs> keep track of how many I'd sent. And by the time the door was full of rejection letters, I went, you know what? Forget it. I, I am never going to get this thing picked up by a publisher. I'm just going to self-publish it. So I did. I self-published that first book. Uh, in her honor. And I created, uh, we were talking, you and I, about Photoshop and InDesign. Yeah. So I also create. So this is a, a wooden, it looks like it's stone, but that's the wooden hammer. That's actually off the cover of the book. So I created my own covers, my own cover art. I made a flip book in the book. So the hammer would spin when you flip the pages. Mm -hmm. I just went to town. I created what I think was a, a great book. And yeah. uh, I did a tour. I quit my job. I went on the road and I toured that book to bookstores and I tried selling it. And by the end of the time, I realized my kids aren't going to be able to eat anymore if I keep this up. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, you can go into a bookstore and you can sell 50 books, which I could easily do. Uh, mm -hmm. I could even out. There was even a bookstore one day and because it was the Harry Potter time. And the lady at the end of the day said, you outsold Harry Potter today. And I went, oh, well, that's kind of cool. Um, so I could sell 50 books. But by the time they took their commission and I paid for my gas, I had enough to buy a jug of milk on the way home. That was it. <laughs> so I had to kind of go, yeah, this, this is not going to cut the mustard. This is not going to work. Mm -hmm. And I put it aside. Well, lo and behold, these last two years come along. And just like you said, Tim, about your grandchildren and children leaving a legacy, yeah. My kids came to me and they're in the house and my grandkids just live a little ways away. And they said, hey, you know, you're not doing shows down at the amphitheater and you got some time. Will you record the hammer for us and finish the other ones as well? Because we want them for ourselves as our as your legacy for us. We want your stories. And I said, OK. And I started recording the hammer. And I worked on the medallion. And then I started recording the medallion. And now I'm working on the scepter. And I'm halfway through that. And I just keep putting out these chapters. And then it clicked. And I went, wait a minute. If I'm recording these for them, why don't I just give them away? This thing owes me nothing. It, it, I, I've done what I needed to do with it before yeah. in a print edition. It doesn't owe me anything. So I just said, away it goes. And I put that thing out to the wind into the ether and said, anybody that wants to can listen to my story and I'll record it for you in my own voice, which I'm not a voice actor. I'm not that great, but it's okay. It's passable. But mm -hmm. uh, so it's out there. And as of last, was it, what did Saturday? As of Monday, this Monday, uh, it had 10,000 downloads. So, uh -huh. you know, people are, are starting to go, I like this story. I mean, it's probably yeah. because it's free, Tim. I mean, let's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you yeah. want to, all those other things. Like you free. free. <laughs> yeah. So, but regardless, uh, talk about enjoyable and fun to have the flexibility of writing a chapter, getting feedback from uh, young people and other people saying, oh, I really like that, but I didn't get why that person did that. And you go, 
whoa, wait a minute. I, I left out a piece there, didn't I? There's a piece of the puzzle. I'm going to either write that into future chapters or I'm going to rewrite that chapter because it's an audiobook. I can re-record and re-release any mm. point in time I want to. And I do that. You know, today I re-recorded chapter third, chapter 40 of the medallion because there was a character in there that was, she wasn't doing the right things and people were catching up and I went, yeah, you know that she needs a, she needs a tweak. So her name's Mara. So she got a tweak and it was great, you know? So life, life has, as it seems that I think as we, you and I said earlier, when, you know, life hands you lemonades, you know, make some lemon. I mean, life hands you lemons, make some lemonade, add some yeah. sugar, do something with it. I mean, even yesterday, for those that end up watching and listening in, for the first time in my life, I missed my appointment with Tim. We were supposed <laughs> to record this yesterday at six o'clock. Yeah. And I missed my appointment. And I I never, I would, it blew me away. And I had, there was a lot of contributing factors, but I, I missed it. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll message him and just see if he shows up. So I did that. And then I sat down with my computer and I thought, well, I'm not going to waste this time. I'm going to do something with it. And as a result of missing your show yesterday, I found one sentence in the scepter that hinted at something and the mind took off and a piece developed in the story that I love. Uh, and it never would have happened if we would have been yesterday, mm -hmm. but it happened because I made a mistake redeemed the mistake and said, let's not waste it. Let's take advantage of this. Now I've got this time and put it into something fruitful. And I wrote 1,333 words. And it's a beautiful story of this young girl whose name is Atia, and the connection she has with this creature and it's been injured. And it just all came together uh, in that time frame. And I just went like, whoa, you know, this is, this is great to see it come about. So failure, they say failure is the back door to success. I guess yeah. if we just keep knocking on it, maybe something will happen. Someone will let you in sooner or later, I'm sure yeah. they will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. So this is up to date then. So life's, life's sort of going on and, and, and you've managed to do some constructive writing creative writing over the last couple of years uh where we've been <laughs> virtually locked down yes and what a, what a, to me that was just a natural it was like yeah. and, and i would admit you know when it first started happening i was getting all upset and i was engaging on diff thing and that thing and the rest of it and then i kind of my brain was going a bit squirrely and i was getting so frustrated and and upset about everything and i just i said you know what I don't have any control over what's going to happen for the next little while. I really don't. Uh, I can talk. I can, I can do whatever. But I'm going to just pull back here and I'm going to find. And so when the kids came with that project, I thought, bang, perfect. I yeah. want to do that. I, that. That, again, creativity, community, that's the kids and the family and the rest of it, and celebration. And the stuff that was going on around me was anything but those three. It was anger and bitterness and vitriol and, 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 and it was soul sucking and, and I didn't like it. I, I didn't like what it was doing to me. And yet to find this project that in the midst of the ashes was a beautiful little flower starting to grow up and sparkle with some color. And I went, I'm going to focus on that. That I have some control over. That I can engage. Uh, that's mine. Uh, that's me. Mm. Right? And. Yeah. It, if I'm going to leave a legacy, it doesn't want to be one of anger and upset and all the rest of it stuff. It's got to be that during this time, I pulled something, pulled the old rabbit out of the hat and said, hey, this is fun. Look at this. Yeah. And who knows? You know, it's, you, you just don't know what tomorrow will bring. You know, it, uh, Absolutely. it's, it's uh, you know, it, things can go really great. And you don't know if it be in a Kohelet in his old 2,500 years ago said, you do not know which endeavor will succeed, whether this, this or that, or if both will do equally well. He said, so plant your seed in the morning, but in the evening, don't let your hands be idle. You know, mm. work at different things. Who knows? You know, my, my book might end up just a dusty place on the internet, or some people might come along and say, boy, that, that was fun. Yeah. I enjoyed that. And, and I learned something. 
Uh, the book is book number two is much harder hitting. Uh, book number one was written for my son and daughter when they were very little. Book number two comes along when they're a little bit older, and it actually deals and delves into uh, teenage addictions, and mm. uh, in a fantasy world. And with my my hero does not become much of a hero, and he makes mistakes, and he starts using the wrong substances in this fantasy world to try to solve problems, and they create more. So mm. uh, I I want to entertain, but I also want to communicate. You know, that's still there. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I, I've got another theory on um, on worry. I mean, so many people get hurt up about worrying about stuff that they don't, they've got no control over. Oh, yeah. So I, I say, if there's no point in worrying about something if you can't do anything about it. Correct. Yeah. If you can do something about it, there's no point in worrying about it because you can do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do it if you can, do. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so, don't worry about the stuff that you can't do anything about because yeah. you, 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 it's pointless worrying about it. And if you yeah. can do something about it, do something about it, then there's no point in worrying about it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> very true. Yeah. For me. yeah. Isn't that something of that old serenity prayer or something? God grant me the wisdom to change the things I can and accept the things I can't and, yeah. and knowing what the difference is and which ones to do. It's that, I think it's that whole concept um, of just kind of having some wi wisdom, I think, is it's an unknown quantity or quality. I've written actually a novelization of that person's life that wrote that book 2,500 years ago. Uh, in current terms, it's called the book of Ecclesiastes. I don't think that's a good name for it. It's actually more the wisdom of Kohelet, who's the guy that wrote it. And it belongs to everybody. It answers one fundamental question. What are you working so hard to obtain? And it's a working person's thesis. It's a philosophy of work. And he's got such beautiful things, but no one understands it. So I actually wrote a story of his life. Uh, and it's in a, mm -hmm. on a website called thescroll.ca. And it's also on all podcasts under my name called The Scroll. And it's a story. It's a lovely story of this older man wanting to write down. It's like you. It's like what you said about I want to leave a legacy. It, the story is this older man living on this marketplace. And he wants to leave behind the things that he's learned in his life. So he writes this book. You know, a generation comes and a generation mm -hmm. goes, but the earth has not changed. He writes down his philosophy of work. But then it gets buried and it gets lost and it gets stuck in a, a strange corner. Um, mm. So I latched onto it, like I said, in those seminary days, and and uh, it's just always been my favorite. Brilliant. Well, Vance, I think we've had quite a bit of a chat today. I've really well, enjoyed that. <laughs> I'm afraid enjoyed I've been I've been I've been the one filling the air and doing the chatting. I always I like. Been. Well, we had a great chat before we got on the program. Yeah. And uh, about the things that, because like I said, then I've been listening to those, the, your story. And to me, your story is an audiobook, and people should mm -hmm. listen to season one as an audiobook biography and you will love it. And I'm on chapter six and I will finish the rest for sure. Because um, I've, yeah, it's just been so enjoyable to listen to your story in that content. And you're a good storyteller, Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, when you describe, it's funny, you describe the apartment in Berlin like it's a yeah. novel and, and I'm walking through that apartment with you and I just go, boy, you, you, it's just, it's really well written and articulated uh, biography of your life and I'm enjoying it. So I would encourage anybody listening to this show, shut Vance off, pick up Tim <laughs> <laughs> and listen to Tim starting on episode one of season one. Yeah. It's only 12 hours long. <laughs> yeah. No. And it's worth every minute. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, friends. Thank well, you very much, Tim. Really enjoyed this. It's been, it's been great. All right. Take care. And you. The Tim Hill Podcasts. Ordinary people's extraordinary stories.